Thankfully, the beaches in LA opened again for exercise only, and by the looks of my love handles, it's not a moment too soon. Not only is swimming and jogging good for physical fitness, I feel it's important to get out of the house into the fresh air for one's psychological well-being and mental health. So while everyone is practicing forced social distancing, try not to distance yourself too much from nature and make sure to keep your outlook positive and your spirits up. That said, the ocean often reminds me of legends about Atlantis, as well as the Minoan civilization, and also today's topic, the Phoenicians. As many of you are already aware by now, the sea levels were three to 400 feet lower during the late Pleistocene, or Ice Age, when Atlantis was said to have existed in the Atlantic Ocean. The glaciers melted in several spurts, with major cataclysms taking place 11,500 years ago, or 9,500 BC, the date given by Plato for the destruction of Atlantis, which perfectly matches the geological record. There were many changes that took place during the time of these cataclysms, such as lakes in the Sahara Desert drying up, and coastal regions of the Mediterranean Sea changing, as well as the subduction of parts of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, where the present-day Azores Islands are located, which is at the triple junction where three tectonic plates meet. The cause of these catastrophes are not completely known yet, but it's believed that one of the probable causes was the arrival of a huge mass of a celestial body that might have passed near the Earth, provoking tremendous tensions in the internal magma of the planet, with magma tides pressuring the thin solid crust of the planet, wrinkling it in some places, and causing sinking and rises in other places. According to legend, Atlantis was the main victim of those cataclysms that contributed to the fall of its powerful civilization. And various ancient texts state that after the continent or island sinking, its survivors went on to settle in other parts of the world, oftentimes around high elevation. Some examples include the Pyrenees Mountains, where the modern-day Basque population lives, a demographic which I point out in my books as being among the highest group of Rh-negative blood type in the world, and in one of my most popular videos with close to 2 million views, which I'll leave a link to in the description, I point out that the Basque themselves attribute their origins to a place called Atlantica. Another mountain that has a people who share similar origin myths, as well as genetic affinities to the Basque, are the Berbers, or Amazigh people, around Mount Atlas in northwest Africa, stretching from Morocco to Algeria and Tunisia. Plato tells us about the conflicts they had with the Egyptians and Greeks and how they finally were defeated in a War of the Titans, or Battle of the Gods, fought to decide which generation would have dominion over the world. It ended in victory for the Olympian gods. Of course, Greece is very close to Turkey, where we find another mountain where survivors of the cataclysmic deluge were said to have settled, the Caucasus Mountains where Mount Ararat is located, and the Bible tells us Noah continued his lineage from. It's clear to me that the biblical tale, which was passed down for many generations, over thousands of years, in its original form was not a story about a man taking two of every type of animal on earth, but specifically pertained to the domesticated animals used in agricultural civilization, such as oxen, horses, cattle, as anthropologically speaking, this is where these animals were distributed from during the Holocene, as well as the gene responsible for blue eyes, diffused by people speaking an Aryan or Proto-Indo-European language. It's also near the oldest known megalithic structures in the world, such as Gobekli Tepe, so there's no conflict between the biblical, mythological, archaeological, linguistic, or genetic record in this regard. It's clear that a powerful and sophisticated antediluvian civilization left indelible marks on the people of the Holocene's culture, meaning our current age, 
after the cataclysms that ended the Pleistocene. And this influence is evident in the Phoenician civilization that was their successor in the sea trade. The Phoenicians inhabited the Mediterranean coasts, the narrow and fertile strip located between the sea and the mountains of Lebanon, near an abundant source of mountain forest and cedar wood used for naval construction. Their religious capital was called Byblos by the Greeks, because papyrus is one of their principal articles in this trade, and the Greeks took the name of the city as their word for book, Byblos, and from their word for books we get our name for the Bible, which means the book. I bring up the Bible again because I want to mention some Phoenician characters in it, which are barely talked about, yet play an important role in influential secret societies today. The Phoenicians were already influential around the year 2000 BC, but their power grew in 1020 BC under the leadership of Abi Baal, whose name means my father is Baal. You might recognize the name Baal as in Baalbek, another Phoenician city adorned in swastikas and Solomon's seal, or some call it the Star of David. Abi Baal was a king of Tyre, one of the oldest continually inhabited cities in the world, and the legendary birthplace of Europa, the princess or goddess from which Europe is named after. Abi Baal was also the father of King Hiram, who made Tyre into the most important Phoenician city and capital of a vast and powerful trading empire. The Bible says that Hiram allied himself with David, king of the unified kingdom of Israel, and built David's palace in Jerusalem. After King David's death, King Hiram maintained his alliance with David's son and successor, King Solomon, referring to him as brother, and establishing trade routes to Egypt, Arabia, Mesopotamia, India, and according to some accounts, the Philippines. This Phoenician trade empire also extended into the British Isles for tin and the copper mines of Michigan, fueling what is termed the Bronze Age. Both kings grew extremely rich and powerful, and according to the Bible, Hiram then built the first temple in Jerusalem. While many are only aware of this temple in literal terms, it has much deeper occult implications, and this strikes at the core of several major secret societies. For example, the tale of Hiram Abiff is passed down in Masonic lodges as central to their third degree. In the legend, Hiram is killed, buried below the temple with secrets inscribed on his grave, which are revealed in this initiation ritual. In an anthropological and historical context, I'd like to point out that this sect of what we're calling Phoenicians and Israelites are connected to the dynasty of pharaohs that are known as Hyksos. The Egyptian word Hyksos means rulers of foreign lands. The Jewish historian Josephus calls them shepherd kings, and they introduced the horse, chariot, and bronze to the African continent. Their origins are from Eurasia, or Western Asia. Josephus identifies the Israelite exodus with the expulsion of the Hyksos, and the 3rd century BC Egyptian historian Manetho reports that they wandered the desert before establishing the city of Jerusalem. That said, I'd like to link these same people, this Egyptian monotheistic dynasty and Israelites with the Templars, the European knights that invaded Palestine and conquered Jerusalem, also known as the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and the Temple of Solomon or Order of Solomon's Temple or the Knights Templar. Now, some people get confused here because they view Europeans as Aryans or Indo-Europeans, and yet Hyksos are considered Semitic. So let's look at these terms a bit closer. Earlier we spoke of Noah, and he was said to have three sons. Each of these sons represents a third of the Old World, but were of the same race, Caucasian, a term which comes from the Caucasus Mountains where Noah settled. Caucasia is an area situated between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, 
and mainly occupied by Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Russia. Aryans or Indo-Europeans are descended from Japheth, the eldest son of Noah. After the Great Flood, his descendants became the Phoenician, Greek, and other Indo-European civilizations. The Greeks knew Japheth as Iapetos. In the Vedas of India, he is known in Sanskrit as Pra-Japati. The Romans knew him as Jupiter. The word Semite comes from Shem, another son of Noah, also Caucasian, same ethnicity, same race. Remember, we're talking about many thousands of years ago. Shem had five sons who settled in what would become modern-day Syria, Iraq, Iran, but in ancient times we would refer to as Babylon, as well as other parts of Asia. Ham was the third and youngest son, and regardless of the misunderstood curse mentioned in the Bible, was also Caucasian, from Caucasia, which became the Caucasian populations of North Africa, such as the North African Moors, who were initially Caucasian Berbers, who today have 8% Sub-Saharan genetics, but centuries and millennia ago were blonde and ginger and looked like this. When the ethnic affinities between these populations are understood, history is less of a mystery and starts making sense. For example, scientists have sequenced the first complete mitochondrial genome of an ancient Phoenician, and according to the researchers, they found the European lineage in North Africa dating to some 2,500 years ago, quote, very unexpected. The haplogroup U5B2C1 is considered to be one of the most ancient haplogroups in Europe. It should only be surprising to someone who did not know that the ancient Mediterranean, including North Africa and the Levant, which is another term for the Phoenician area around modern Lebanon, shared a similar phenotype. In other words, they were ethnically white people. Which brings us to the meaning of the word Jew. The English term Jew originates in the biblical word for Yehudi, meaning from the kingdom of Judah, or in a more religious meaning, worshiper of one God. After the death of King Solomon, sometimes around 930 BC, the kingdom of Israel split into a northern kingdom, which retained the name Israel, and a southern kingdom called Judah. The earliest mention of the word Israel comes from an inscription carved on stone erected by an Egyptian pharaoh around 1200 BC. The northern tribes and southern tribes had a war, which I won't get into now, but it weakened them both, and around 735 BC, the Assyrian Empire launched attacks and eventually dispersed the northern tribes to the north and into Europe as well as into the Mediterranean. This is where you get the term lost tribes from. Essentially, the Assyrians sided with Judah, or the southern tribes, and so only Judah was left. This lasted for a few decades, and in 587 BC, Judah was also destroyed by a Babylonian king, and its inhabitants were taken into slavery. This is not only biblical history, but documented on cuneiform tablets. The first temple and Jerusalem were destroyed, and its people deported to Babylon. The Babylonians were eventually conquered by the Persian Empire, and the Persian king Cyrus the Great gave the Jews permission to return to Jerusalem. Cyrus the Great called himself Arian, and that was the word he used, from the Arian race, etched in stone by his grave still visible today. Zoroastrianism was his religion, and incidentally is also argued as being one of the first, if not the first, monotheistic faith. So after the Jews returned to the Levant, call it Palestine, call it Israel, call it whatever you want, but after they returned, any other Israelite that also returned until present day were also called Jews. So remember, there were other tribes, and collectively they were known as Israelites. And the Israelites, according to Manetho, were Hyksos, and the Hyksos were the ones that introduced Ra worship to ancient Egypt, replacing the Pantheon and the many cults with what modern historians attribute as the first recognized version of monotheism, the worship of one God. 
So let's look at the etymology of the word Jew again. Let's look at the religious meaning. If you Google it, you'll likely see something like this. Worshipper of one God. So when people call Ashkenazi, Germanic Jews, fake Jews, while they may not have been part of the southern kingdom, literally one of the two tribes in the south, particularly Judah, they still consider themselves part of the monotheistic race, which came out of Egypt as the Hyksos dynasty, which prior to that entered Egypt from Eurasia, or the Caucasian region, or Western Asia. Racially and ethnically, Semitic and Aryan, in an anthropological context, are indistinguishable. In modern times, there's been a lot of race mixing, especially when we're talking about slavery, Islam, and all that comes with that. I really wanted to make this video about the Phoenician presence in South America, but that will have to wait for another video. I'll close this presentation with one final point. I've linked the descendants of Noah, or Caucasians, with the pharaohs of Egypt, with the Israelites and Phoenicians, and with the Knights Templar. And to give it one last twist, I'll extend that line to not only Germanic tribes and royal families, but to the Nationalist Socialist Party of Germany in the 30s and 40s. The European royal families are predominantly of Rh negative blood type. I've already discussed the links between Scotland and ancient Egypt in another prior video, which was also very popular with over a million views, so I won't repeat myself now, but will include a link in the description for those who might have missed it. The people collectively known as Israelites were dispersed or deported from the Middle East after the conquest by the Assyrian Empire around 720 BC. The Jewish historian Josephus wrote that, quote, The ten tribes are beyond the Euphrates till now and are an immense multitude and not to be estimated in numbers. Some of the names of these tribes became known as the Camerians, Scythians or Scythians, Goths, Celts, Anglo-Saxons, and Vikings. These days, many of their descendants have been converted to Christianity, so no longer retain any connection to their ancient ancestry. One such tribe is that of Dan, whose migration left their name in parts of Europe, such as the Danube River, or the nation of Denmark, as can be seen on this 17th century Dutch map. Remnants of these people can also be identified in Scotland and Ireland, with some tribes becoming the Amish in America, and others settling South Africa, establishing agricultural civilization there 500 years ago, but today have lost their land and identity to Afrocentric communism and face total genocide. Scandinavian people in general being amongst the most lactose tolerant people on earth, meaning they can digest milk as adults, a genetic trait that stems from Aryans of Eurasia who domesticated cattle and disseminated them into Europe during the Holocene along with blue eyes. Northern Europeans also have a relatively high degree of rhesus negative blood type. According to Herodotus, the Neuri were a tribe living beyond the Scythian, roughly the area of modern northern Ukraine and southern Belarus, also said to be the ancestors of the Slavic people. In the 18th century, the Swedish historian Olaf von Dalen believed that the ancient Finns, alongside Laps and Estonians, who sprung from the Nuri, ultimately descended from the lost tribes of Israel. Quote, the Nuri seem to have been remnants of the ten tribes of Israel, which the king of Assyria brought as captives out of Canaan. When one realizes that the language of these ancient Finns, Laps, and Estonians is similar to the Hebrew, and even that this people in ancient times reckoned their years beginning from the 1st of March and Saturday as their Sabbath, then one sees that the Nuri in all probability had this origin. Finland is most commonly identified with the tribe of Issachar. Incidentally, the Finnish word for father is Issa. Which brings us to the Germans, who are closely related genetically to Britons, Dutch, and Scandinavians. While the Middle Eastern or Eurasian origins of certain Nordic and Germanic tribes is documented in the 12th century by the Icelandic historian 
Snorri Sturluson in the Chronicles of the Kings of Norway. Sturluson wrote that they, under the leadership of a priest chief Odin, had trekked from regions south of the Caucasus Mountains called Turkland via Russia to Northern Europe. Quote, on the south side of the mountains, which lie outside of all inhabited lands, runs a river through Swithold, which is properly named by the name of Tanais, but was formerly called Tanaquissel or Vanaquissel, and which falls into the Black Sea. The country of the people on Vanaquissel was called Vanaland or Vanaheim, and the river separates the three parts of the world, of which the easternmost part is called Asia and the westernmost Europe. Swithoid was the Scandinavian name for Scythia, which covered a vast area including all of southern Russia, most of Ukraine, and most of Central Asia. Tanais was the ancient name for the river Don. Sturluson continues, quote, There goes a great mountain barrier from the northeast to southwest, which divides the great Swithoid from other kingdoms. South of this mountain ridge, it is not far to Turkland, where Odin had great possessions. In those times, the Roman chiefs went wide around in the world, subduing to themselves all people, and on this account many chiefs fled from their domains. But Odin, having foreknowledge and magic sight, knew that his posterity would come to settle and dwell in the northern half of the world. He therefore set his brothers V and Vilge over Asgard, and he himself, with all the gods and a great many other people, wandered out, first westward to Garterlake, and then south to Saxland. He had many sons, and after having subdued an extensive kingdom in Saxland, he set his sons to rule the country. He himself went northward to the sea, and took up his abode in an island which is called Odin's Island in Finn. Saxland is Saxony. The mentioned sea is the Baltic Sea. The largest city on Finn, the third largest Danish island, is Odense, a name which means Odin's island. The Danish historian Peter Friedrich Schum wrote, speaking of Scandinavians, that, quote, the ancestors of ourselves, the Germans, and the Celts, lived together in Asia Minor. Snorri Sturluson and Peter Friedrich Schum did trace the ancestors of the Nordic and Germanic tribes back to the Caucasus regions and Turkey, but they did not trace them further than that. They did not trace them all the way back to the lost tribes of Israel, but in 1723, the French Huguenot Dune Jacques Abedi, who lived in exile in Germany, the Netherlands, and Britain, did so in the book La Triomphe de la Providence et de la Religion. Quote, Unless the ten tribes of Israel are flown into the air or sunk into the earth, they must be the ten Gothic tribes that entered Europe in the 5th century, overthrew the Roman Empire, and then founded the ten nations of modern Europe. Four of those Germanic tribes, the Eastern Franks, the Bavarians, Swabians, and Saxons, evolved into Germany after the division of Charlemagne's Frankish Empire in the 9th century. The origins of the modern state of Germany began with the Frankish Empire. The Franks were a large Germanic tribe that lived around the Lower Rhine in what today is West Middle Germany, parts of the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, and Northern France. They defeated the Roman governor who ruled Northern France in 507, defeated the Visigoths, and annexed Southwest Gaul. Charlemagne expanded the kingdom of the Franks, and on Christmas 800 AD in Rome, Charlemagne was crowned emperor of the Frankish Empire by Pope Leo III. Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, inherited the empire, but after his death and a brief civil war, his three sons divided the empire into three parts. Early in the 10th century, the kingdom of Germany was made up of tribal duchies of the larger Germanic tribes. Between the 10th and 13th century, the German tribal duchies dissolved into regions ruled by families or nobility. That said, I'd like to reiterate some information that I covered in a previous video about the Templar Society, a German Protestant sect 
with roots in the Pietist movement of the Lutheran Church. They spell Templar differently than the Knights Templar, but their beliefs also revolve around rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem, the land reclaimed by the Knights Templar during the Crusades, the part of the Levant once considered part of the Phoenician Empire, and where the Egyptian historian Manetho claimed that the Hyksos pharaohs settled by those that the Bible calls Israelites. I'll also leave a link to that video in the description for those interested in following this line of research. There's a lot more I can say about this subject, but it'll have to wait. For now, I'd like to point out some interesting facts about President Trump, whose paternal ancestry is traceable to Bohemian Amberg, a village in southwestern Germany in the 18th century. Its residents are known as Palatines. Their historic coat of arm is the Palatine Lion, with its tongue extended, a red crown, symbols of their ruling families as seals, and also on the Bavarian coat of arms. Bavaria's origins date back to Celts and Subian groups. The Celts identify as one of the lost tribes that entered Europe, and the Subians should sound familiar to my readers as in Swabia, or Neuschwabenland, the area of Antarctica annexed by the nationalist Germans and central to Operation High Jump, the classified post-World War II military invasion of Antarctica by Allied forces. Johann Trump, born in Bobenheim in 1789, moved to the nearby village of Kalstadt, where his grandson, Frederick Trump, the grandfather of Donald Trump, was born in 1869. This German heritage was long concealed by Donald Trump's father, Fred Trump, after World War II and until the 1980s. He told people he was of Swedish ancestry. Donald Trump repeated this version in The Art of the Deal, published in 1987, but later said he was proud of his German heritage. Of course, Sweden was founded by the same group of people that we call Swabians, and very few people understand what that means. That said, one needs only look at the occult, meaning hidden, symbology of the Trump Tower to gain a deeper insight into his true ancestry. Completed in 1983, it has an official height of 664 feet, but if you count its spire, however, it raises its height to 666 feet. While 666 is called the number of the beast in most manuscripts of Revelation, a fragment of the earliest papyrus gives a number of 616 as the original number of the beast. In a Kabbalistic context, 666 is a positive holy number associated with light, or the sun, and the heart chakra. 666 is also the number of the goddess, such as Ishtar, Isis, Aphrodite, and is sacred in Egyptian mythology. It's related to sex, fertility, and motherhood. That said, Trump Tower also features an inverted triangle made up of trees or bushes. An upside down triangle is also a symbol of the goddess. In alchemy, it means water or the divine feminine energy. And if you look closely, you'll see that the trees are arranged in three rows of six, making up the three sides of the triangle. I'd like to also point out that the tree itself is a sacred sex symbol, from the tree in the Garden of Eden, to the fig or Bodhi tree associated with Buddha and enlightenment, which is really a reference to Tantra. Above this inverted triangle of trees, we see seven pillars rising. If you count the points at the top of the building, you'll notice there are seven, which in Tantra are the number of chakras in the human body. In astral theology, there are seven gods, meaning the five visible planets with the naked eye, plus the sun and the moon. In Islam, or Sufi cosmology, there are seven heavens and hells. And of course, in the biblical context, it's the seven days of creation. In a more esoteric perspective, Seven has to do with sacred geometry. As Pythagoras tells us, the number seven is, quote, the essence or first principle of things. That said,
Donald Trump is of RH negative blood type. I think that's enough for now. So I'd like to thank you for listening. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those who are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts. So please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful week and I hope to see you again soon.